Okay, so we're going to talk about the set of rational numbers. So this is going to be taking the numbers we've been learning about, in particular the integers, and writing them as a ratio or as a fraction. So we're going to see this a over b, which are the regular fractions that you've seen, but the actual definition is that the a and the b, both of those are integers. And the parts of the fraction, when we talk about the a, that is in the numerator. And the B is in the bottom, that one we call the denominator. Now the word numerator comes from the Latin word um, for numbered. And so here it's going to be basically meaning how many. The word denominator comes from the Latin for namer which is really basically telling us the size of our pieces. Because we're gonna talk about fractions in two different ways. One of them is as uh, parts of a whole. So if we see a fraction or a rational number that looks like two with that fraction bar three, we can see that as something like a portion of a whole. So like two thirds of a pizza we're saying that we have our pizza broken up into three slices. So we know that what a size, well they should be equal pieces, but we know that the size of a piece is one third and the two is telling us how many. So we know we have two of those pieces. So before I go back for other, a couple other representations, there was two other words here that we have and that's a proper fraction and an improper fraction. And so we'll have a proper fraction anytime that our uh, numerator is less than the denominator. And we'll have an improper fraction anytime the numerator is bigger than the denominator. And we have unit fractions. Those are fractions that have the numerator of one. So there's some of the common like a half and a third and a fourth. Those are our unit fractions. So going back to the different uses of the rational number, we just talked about the parts of a whole, but we also um, have seen a need for them when you're talking about solving a problem like 3x equals 2. Trying to find some number that you can multiply by 3 to make 2, well, there's no whole number or integer that does that. But we know from our solving of equations that if you divide both sides by 3, x equals 2 thirds is a solution to that. So it helps us solve that multiplication problem. We know that 3 times 2 thirds will get us that 2. Another way to see um, this fraction or the use of rational numbers is as a ratio. So I could say the ratio of like my cream to my coffee is two to three. So maybe that means I really like my cream. Um, then I have um, the pro use um, as probability. So if I asked you like, what's the probability of getting a number less than, uh, let's see, we need to do this, less than five on a dice or die, I guess. So the numbers that pop up on a dice, we have a one, two, three, four, five, and it goes all the way to six. So the probability of getting a number less than five, well, it's those four options. So we're gonna say that there are four ways to get that out of six, so that's our probability. But we have seen before that four, six is really two thirds. So I just showed you um, four different ways that we will be using rational numbers or that we use rational numbers. So then next what we wanna do is order numbers. So we wanna think about how to place them on a number line. And um, it's really important as we're talking about parts of a whole that we place zero and one first. Um, so I'm gonna put zero right in the middle because it's kind of a standard. Um, and then I'm gonna leave some room for one, and it looks like I have all fractions, but I don't know if any of them are bigger than one, just glancing at it. 
I'll put some negativity in there since I have some negative fractions. Uh, and so I'm kind of drawn to the whole numbers first. So just making sure that I mark those whole, or actually integers, negative two and negative one are not whole numbers. So I'm gonna have a uh, negative two marked on my number line. I'll have two and then the negative one. Now the rest of them are um, rational numbers that are not integers. And so when I look at three fourths as my first guy, I know that four is the size of my piece, or in this case, the length. So I need to break my whole, so this guy is my whole, into four equal parts, which means drawing three lines equal distance apart, so that's pretty close. And then basically we, we can count by fourth. So this is one fourth of the distance to one. This is another fourth, so then we're at two fourths. Another fourth, so we're at three fourths. And then another one, we're at four fourths, which equals one whole. And we could keep continuing this. We could say, okay, let's break this section into three equal pieces. So we have five fourths, six fourths, seven fourths, all the way to eight fourths, which eight divided by four is two. So three fourths, marking that on here. And then we have five fourths, which you can see is a little bit bigger than one. So I got that guy and that guy. Now when we get to the negative, remember that just means on the opposite side. So this is gonna be on the opposite side a little bit more than one, negative one. So we're gonna mark it there. Um, then we have, let me fix that a little bit nicer. Okay, so then we have, um, this is negative five over four, we have negative three fourths. So we're gonna do the same thing. Let's kind of flip flop this over. So it's three fourths. So we know that it's not gonna be at one, but close. We could put the marks in there. And so we know that this is negative three over four. And they're equidistance from that zero. So I got negative five fourths, negative three fourths. I need a half. So a half is gonna take my whole and break it up into, again, this is the name or size of my piece. So I need two pieces. I'll just make one line right in the middle and that happens to coincide with two fourths, which should sound familiar, but that's gonna be one half. That's the distance from zero to that. that to, it's half of the whole. If we go another half, then we'd be at two over two. So we can see, um, those fractions are actually what we call equivalent. So we have the one half marked on there. We got that guy. And so then we need seven fourths. Well, I already have that because I marked out a bunch of the fourths. So now everything's been placed on the number line. Now a reminder about order. The smaller you are, the more to the left you are. So sometimes I'll say something like to the left is less. So if I wanted to order these numbers, I would have negative two, negative five fourths. When I say order, um, from little to big. So from the littlest number or least number to the biggest, or we can say the greatest number. A lot of similar words there. So we have negative five fourths, then we'll be at negative one, negative three fourths, one half, three fourths, five fourths, seven fourths, and two. So those are our numbers ordered from least to greatest. On this next page, we're gonna talk about estimating fractions. And with that, it's really nice to compare fractions that aren't that familiar to some kind of baseline benchmark fractions. And so when we say benchmark fraction, we're talking about on our number line, being closer to zero or closer to one or closer to one half. So those are uh, often the benchmark fractions. They're like the most common ones. And so when we go and we look at question number one, it wants to know which is more. So you can use pictures, pattern blocks, number lines, and you should pause right now and try and think about which ones you think are more or less and come up with a reason using a picture or some sort of number line or something. So I'll give you that to pause. 
now that you have tried, let's kind of see some of my reasoning why I would say um, which one's more or less. So I think that six twelfths would be more because they're broken into the same size pieces. And so six is the number of pieces that I have. So I would know that that would be greater. You could take a number line, since we were just talking about that on the previous page, and we're talking about from zero to one, if you break that up into 12 pieces, let's see, I would have to draw um, 11 marks here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 markings, and so four twelfths would be going over, there's one twelfth, two twelfths, three twelfths, four twelfths, so there's four twelfths, um, then I have I go one more twelfth, one more twelfth, then six twelfths is right there. Now for number two, um, I look at one third and one fifth. They both have the same number of pieces, so I'm thinking about, this one actually says pizza, so it makes me think of a circle. If I break that up, one third, it's a little less than a half of the pizza, one-fifth, I'd have to break that up into even more pieces. So as I think about that, that means my pieces have to be even smaller. And so that means one-third would for sure have to be bigger than one-fifth. For the next one, it wants to know about being less. So one-half of a bag of chips, let's do a different picture here. There's a half of the bag. But if I have three-fourths of the bag, that's breaking up into smaller pieces, but I have three of them this time, so that's going to be a little bit more. And so we're going to have that one half would be less. Um, the next one we have less again, but this thing at time it says three-sixths or two-thirds. Well, three-sixths, I already kind of know that that's a half. And so two thirds is a little bit more than a half. So this is a half and this is more than a half. And the reason I know that it's more than a half is because half would, of that three would end up being, and it looks kind of weird, 1.5 out of three, which I know that 1.5 is not an integer. And so it doesn't look like a rational number, but it is if we divide that. Um, and so it, and so it, um, we know that it will be um, three six will be the lesser one. Again, you could use pictures or some other um, way, but I wanted you to show which one's bigger. For the last one, it's going um, really into that benchmark idea. And so if we think about um, how close things are to zero, one half, and one, um, that might help us with some of our estimating. So if we look at the fraction five twelfths, Zero as a fraction, so we're saying as a fraction with that same denominator, would be zero out of 12, because you have none of those pieces. Half, well, if there's 12 pieces and you have half, that would be six out of the 12. One means you have the whole thing, that would be 12 out of 12. So now what it wants us to do is look at that 5 twelfths and say, how far is that from zero? Well, zero is zero twelfths, so that means we'd be five twelfths away the distance from a half. So between 5 twelfths and 6 twelfths, that distance is only 1 twelfth away. And last, the distance from 1, which is 12 twelfths, it's going to take 7 twelfths to get there. So what it's closest to, and you can see, um, is going to be that 1 twelfth. And so our benchmark number is 1 half. So what we're saying is that if you were asked to estimate what 5 twelfths is, it would be about 1 half, so it's pretty close, and that's our benchmark. Again, using those more familiar numbers, the 0, the half, and the 1. So then we have 2 tenths, and you can start to look at these numbers and see um, what, kind of give a guess, um, but we're going to write out what these distances are. So you could pause it and try and fill this out yourself, um, and then we're going to come back. So now that we're back, 2 tenths is the fraction we're looking at, so we're going to have to write each of these fractions that we know the size. All of them are out of 10. So um, 0 as a fraction is going to be 0. Half would be 5. 1 would be 10. 
So for the first one, when we're looking at the distance from zero, that would be two away, so two tenths away. Then we're looking at two tenths and five tenths, that's three tenths away. Two tenths and 10 tenths, that's gonna be eight tenths away. So the smallest distance here is the two tenths, so that's gonna be our benchmark. We're closest to zero then. And then we have the elevenths. And that one's again, not such a familiar fraction. So we're gonna write, um, let's see, out of 11, out of 11. So we know zero would be zero out of 11, and we know the whole would be 11 out of 11, but what would a half be? And that's why this one isn't so familiar, but halfway would be at 5.5. Again, we don't normally write our fractions that way, um, but it gives us what half would be. So um, if we are the, looking at each of these distance from zero, we're eight elevenths away. Here, eight to 5.5, we're gonna take, it would be two and a half elevenths away. And then to get to 11, we'd be three elevenths away. So this one's pretty close. Eight elevenths is really close between um, the one half and the one, but we're gonna say that we're closest to the one half. So then next we're gonna look at 20th, and that would be a 0 20th, 10 20th, that one's not that bad, 20 out of 20. So we're looking at the distance away from zero, that would be 5 20ths away, 5 20ths away for that one also, and then 15 20ths away. And so what we see is that 5 12ths is actually right in the middle between zero and a half, and that should make sense a little bit. You might already know that that's one fourth. And so our benchmark number, he'd be right if you said either zero or one half. It really depends if you were estimating um, by rounding kind of up or rounding down. All right, the next one we have is 19. So we have a 19, 19. So zero 19 would be zero, 19 19 is one whole. And so half, you'd have to have about 9.5. And so again, we're gonna go through and see the distance from zero would be 17 nineteenths. Um, the distance to that middle point would end up being about seven and a half. And the last one is two nineteenths away. So you can see that we're really closest to one. And that should make sense because 17 nineteenths means you only need two more nineteenths in order to make that whole. So as you start seeing these fractions as close to the benchmarks, you'll be able to estimate much better. So the last one we have out of sevenths, out of sevenths, so zero sevenths, this will be three and a half sevenths, and the last one here, that would be seven sevenths. So the distance from zero, we have five sevenths, 1.5 sevenths, and then two sevenths. So our benchmark here would be the half, and it should kind of make sense again. You look at five sevenths and you're like, oh, that's kind of halfway there. So in your head, you can start imagining that halfway would be at three and a half, so it's pretty close. Um, but it's also kind of close to one because that's only two away, so which one's closer? Well, if we were actually right, it will say a half, so. All right, we're gonna flip over to the next page with fraction strips. And so these are common um, manipulatives that are used in elementary school. So that way students can actually like line up fractions to see which things are visually equivalent and so then will be equivalent. So they start with the baseline that this thing is one. And so you can see that it takes two of the one halves to make one. So we could say two of those halves equals one. So what I want you to do is take a couple minutes to look at the fraction strips and note which ones are gonna be equivalent. And again, they have to like match up so you can see that like the one bar is equal to two of those one halves. And we can even go more and say three of the thirds is one, four of the fourths is one, and so on. I'm gonna give you a minute to pause it and try. So a couple that I'm noticing is that um, two of the fourths equals one of the halves, so that those would be equivalent fractions. And again, some of these you already know, but this is just a visual representation of what you already know. 
So I also have that one, the eighth, if I have four of them, that's also equal to a half. So that's also equal to two fourths. And also the three sixths is equal to all of those things as well. Let's see, what else do we have in here? We have, um, if you take three of those fourths, those line up with all those eighths. And so it takes one, two, three, four, five, six. So six eighths will equal three fourths. And there's probably a few more that I'm missing. Let's see, oh, the sixth. So we have two of those thirds is the same as four of those six. So two of the thirds is the same as four six. And um, let's see, I'm trying to see if any other lines match up. Um, I think that's gonna be about all of them. Let's see if you found more. The fundamental law of fractions says that if A over B is a fraction and we have that N doesn't equal zero, then A over B is equal to some multiple of A over some multiple of B. Where so we basically just saw that when we're writing all the equivalent fractions up here. So just, I'm just gonna randomly grab one. So we know is, or sorry, four eighths is equal to one half. We can see that visually. So how does that match up with this new, um, this law of fractions? Well, it says that one half is equal to a multiple of A. So if we're up to four, that would be a multiple of four. And let's see if I do two times four. So this is basically acting as my N, that's equivalent. And so that will follow for all of the equivalent fractions up above. And so when we say that a fraction is in simplest form, what we're saying is that the A over B will have no uh, factors at all in common. So you can see that when we're looking at the four eighths, four and eight, they have a GCD of four. And so we know that that's not considered reduced because basically we can get rid of that four. <clears throat> so we need that the GCD is equal to one. Or just a reminder, the GCD greatest common divisor or GCF greatest common factor, those were the same words. So if we look at maybe a little bit bigger of an example, we look at negative 60 and 210. So what we wanna do is put this in simplest form. So we wanna make sure that the GCD is equal to one, which is really just saying that there's no factors in common between our numerator and our denominator. So when I look at 60 and 210, I see that they both have a 10 in common. So I'm gonna rewrite this as negative six times 10 over 21 times 10. So since they have that same factor, we know that this is gonna be equal to negative six over 21. But then I realized that negative six and 21, they both have a three in common. So I can rewrite this as negative two times three and seven times three. And so again, we see that common factor there. So we can rewrite this as negative two over seven. And that is our fraction written in its simplest form. Or sometimes we say the lowest terms. But we know that two and seven, the GCD of two and seven is just one. They don't have any factors in common. Okay, so we have a few that you wanna try. So make sure again you pause and try them and then come check back. So we're looking at 84 squared, that's the power two on there. So I'm gonna just start to rewrite it as 84 times 84, and then 91 times 91. Well, right now I don't see any factors in common. So I'm gonna try and think about what can divide um, these numbers. So 84, that's actually gonna be, like, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, I look at 91 and that totally looks prime. So let's see, I think it's gonna be 13 with something. Oh, 13 and seven, because that would make a 21 and then a 70, that one works. So 91 is 13 times seven. 
and I'm trying to see if there's factors in common. So if um, seven's on the bottom, maybe seven divides 84. So let's check that. Ah, uh, yes, 12 times seven is 84. And so we have that. So as you look at that, you can see the factors that they have in common. And so that means we can rewrite this as 12 times 12 or 13 times 13, which is really 144 over 169. Um, for the next one, we just have zero um, divided by 68. Well, that's just going to be zero. They um, have no factors um, in common. And I just want to remind you that we can always check this because some people forget if this is undefined or if it's zero. And the check is to re-see the fraction is actually the division problem. And so if you want to check that it's zero, you take zero times the 68 and we know that that is zero. Um, the last one here, we have 3,750 over 10,000. Well, that's nice. The zero's at the end, we know that they have a 10 in common. So some of you guys might even see um, just rewriting it without the last two zeros, but I wanna actually show why that works. That's 1,000 times the 10. And so those are that common factor. So we'll rewrite this as 375 over 1,000, which five will divide both of those because they both end with a five or a zero. So that will be five times 75 should work. And then five times 200. And so they have that in common. So then I'm left with 75 over 200. And so if you notice, I'm not finding the biggest factor that they have in common. You could find that. Um, I'm just doing little factors at a time. So again, I notice that 5 will go into both of these. So that's going to be 3 times 25. I mean, not 5. 25 goes in both of those because you see a lot of like quarter type numbers. So then that will be 8 times 25, like 8 quarters. And so kind of cruising along a little bit faster by seeing that bigger number. But then you can see that the final answer is going to be 3 8. That simplified. They have no other factors in common. Now, sometimes we want to know if the two factions are equal just by looking at them. And so one of the tests that you can do if you're checking on these two fractions is to see if the product, or sometimes we'll say cross product, AD equals BC. So if these two fractions are equal, the product of A times D has to equal the product of B times C. Again, sometimes we call that the cross product. So when you have something like two-fourths is equal to that, that's the question. Well, if you could try and figure out what you can multiply by to make those happen. Um, but you can also check two times 2196, and you want to show that it's equal to four times 1098 which it is. This is going to be 4,392, and that's equal to 4,392. So just a little comment really quick about if you're like, why does that actually work? Well, if you wanted to rewrite the, um, equa the fractions into something having the same denominators, not necessarily the least, but sometimes um, what you can do is just multiply the four times 2196. We saw that earlier. And so four times 2196. And so what that means is I'm multiplying the top and bottom of this fraction really by four and the top and bottom of this one by 2196 over 2196. So if you look at it, we're seeing two times 2196 and four times 1098 and then comparing these two numbers, which they are equal. So it tells you your fractions are equal. We're gonna see in a minute that using something similar to that, we'll be able to look at when one fraction is less than another fraction by something similar. Um, so right before that though, we have this um, area model to show instead. So we know that two thirds is equal to six ninths. Some of you guys just know that off the top of your head. We can use our quick cross product checked and say, oh, well two times nine is equal to six times three, check. Um, but to use an area model, just means that we wanna represent them with a picture. 
and show that they are equivalent to each other. So we have two thirds going on first. And then we have six ninths. So I want to draw the exact same size square as close as I can. I probably could have copied that image there. And ninths, if you think about it, are our thirds broken up into three equal pieces. So I'm going to just cut them that way. So that way I have nine equal pieces. And it says I have six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can see that it's really taking the two, same two columns. So that's showing with the area model that those are equal. Now the last concept that we have is called the denseness of rational numbers. And what that means is that between any two rational numbers, there's always another number. Um, and so if you look at the two fractions, 5, 6, and 83 hundredths, we want to be able to say, well, what's a fraction between them? One way to do that is to rewrite them with the same denominators and see what's going on. So if I look at 6 and 100, I can just say 600 really quick. So 600 and 600. And so we have that. That will be 500 over 600 compared to well, 83 times 6. So times 6 will be 498. And so that we know that they're not equal, but I could see that I could just put a little fraction right in the middle there. That would be 499 over 600. Now, if we're talking about counting by hundredths, we're a little tight. And so we need to put in one more fraction. So it says two fractions. So we found one fraction for sure between those two. But now it's like we need to find a fraction between these two guys. And so if I think about... Um, if I add, and this might feel kind of weird, but if I add the numerators, I'd get 999. If I add the denominators, I would get 1200. Now I claim that that's gonna be right in the middle of those two. And the reason why is because if I multiply five times 600, five, or sorry, 500 times 600, and compare it to 499 times 600, so those two cross products, we know they're not equal to each other. The 600 part's equal, but look at This says we have 500 of them. This says we have 499. So we know that to have 500 of them is going to be bigger. And so we have that 500 over 600 is bigger than 999 over 1,200. And we know that that's bigger than 499 over 600, which is bigger than 498 over 600. So we have two fractions that fit right between them. Now I use this statement already, but I think we kind of saw it from up above about why this um, is going to be true. Well, if you look at our original statement, if the denominators are matching each other, we know that those two fractions um, are A over B is less than C over B as long as the numerators are. So the comparison is that if they don't have the same denominators, the common denominators would be that BD. So if I multiply AD, so A multiply by D there, multiply by B there, this will be AD. BD, which is an equivalent fraction, CB, DB, which is an equivalent fraction. And now the denominators, even though they're flip-flopped, they still match. And so we had that this was strictly less. And so then that means that the AD must be less than the CB. Since the denominators are the same now, we know that that must be true. So anytime two fractions have that, um, one's less than the other, we can compare their cross products as well. One for